The sound was unmistakable, a violent rhythmic shuddering that shook the entire locomotive. The massive driving wheels of the Pennsylvania Railroad's T1 duplex were spinning uncontrollably, digging into the rails with the force of a thousand horsepower earthquake. The engineers had created a monster, an engine with so much power it couldn't grip the steel beneath it. This is the central paradox of the colossal steam engine. In the quest to conquer mountains and haul unprecedented loads, railroads built mechanical giants that devoured the very tracks they were meant to run on. The fundamental compromise between steel strength and locomotive weight had been broken. Ambition had created a beast that was literally eating its own world. To understand why these engines were so destructive, you need to look beyond their static weight. Sure, an Allegheny locomotive weighed over 771,000 pounds, but that's a colossal amount of force pressing down on the rails. But that was just the beginning. The real damage came from the dynamic forces, the living, breathing violence of the machine in motion. The most destructive of these forces was called hammer blow. Imagine the massive pistons inside the cylinder slamming back and forth with incredible force. Those pistons connect to rods, and those rods connect to cranks on the driving wheels. Every piston reversal hammered the track like a sledgehammer, not constant pressure, but rhythmic destruction with every wheel revolution. On a conventional engine, this was manageable, but on a behemoth with eight or more massive driving wheels, the hammer blow became a destructive symphony, vibrating the track structure to its core and accelerating fatigue in the steel. But hammer blow was just background noise compared to the main event, uncontrolled wheel slip. And this is where the duplex design created a unique and catastrophic problem. The whole point of a duplex like the PRR T1 or S1 was to get more power without making the locomotive impossibly long. The solution was to take two sets of cylinders and driving wheels and mount them on one rigid frame, creating essentially two engines in one. On paper, it was brilliant. In practice, it was a nightmare of coordination. Here's why it failed so spectacularly. Imagine pressing the gas in a rear wheel drive car on ice while someone else controls the front wheels independently. That was the T1's fundamental problem. The two engine units were mechanically linked, but never perfectly synchronized. When the front pistons fired, they would apply torque to the front driving wheels. A fraction of a second later, the rear pistons would fire, applying torque to the rear wheels. If the rails were even slightly wet or greasy, the front wheels would break traction first and start to spin. But the rear engine was still delivering power, shoving the entire locomotive forward. This would unload the front wheels even more, causing them to spin faster. Suddenly, you had a violent, uncontrolled slip where two engines were fighting each other instead of working together. Think of a high-performance sports car with too much horsepower spinning its wheels on ice, but scale that up to a 6,550 horsepower machine weighing hundreds of tons. The force is unimaginable. The spinning wheels aren't just slipping, they're grinding the surface of the rail like sandpaper. In seconds, they can heat the steel to a point where it loses its temper, becoming brittle and vulnerable. They can literally weld microscopic particles of steel from the wheel to the rail, creating a rough, damaged surface that leads to more slipping. It was a vicious, self-reinforcing cycle of destruction. The very feature that made the duplex powerful, its two-in-one design, was also its greatest mechanical flaw, turning it into a rail-eating monster whenever conditions were less than perfect. And if you think that sounds bad, imagine being the engineer trying to explain to your supervisor why you just melted a quarter mile of track on your first day. But wheel slip was just one symptom of a deeper design flaw. If the duplex was a problem of coordination, the articulated mallet locomotive represented a different kind of threat, a problem of constant grinding violence. Articulation was the brilliant solution for getting a long, powerful locomotive around sharp curves. Instead of one rigid frame, the engine was hinged, allowing the front set of driving wheels to pivot independently. This gave birth to legends like the Union Pacific Big Boy and the C&O H8 Allegheny, 
true titans of the rails. On a curve, this flexibility was a godsend. But on straight track, it became a weapon. The problem was a phenomenon called nosing. Because the front engine unit was free to pivot laterally, it wouldn't track perfectly straight. It would constantly hunt back and forth, shoving against the rails. This wasn't an occasional event. It was a continuous, relentless action. With every revolution of the wheels, the front of the locomotive would exert a lateral force, pushing against the rail head and the gauge side of the track. This constant shoving had two devastating effects. First, it wore down the sides of the rails at an accelerated rate. Second, and more dangerously, it worked on the track infrastructure itself. Every spike holding the rail in place was subjected to repetitive lateral stress. Over miles and miles of running, this would loosen spikes, shift the rail anchors, and distort the entire roadbed. The track would literally begin to spread apart under the relentless pressure. Maintenance crews would have to follow behind these giants, redriving spikes and realigning track that had been shoved out of position. The articulated locomotive, designed for flexibility, was using that flexibility to batter the track structure into submission. Now, compare the two approaches. The Allegheny's articulation delivered its violence through brute force lateral shoving, a constant, predictable grinding that wore down the infrastructure. The duplex's violence was more complex and unpredictable. Its wheel slip was a sudden explosive event that focused intense thermal energy on small sections of rail, causing localized damage that was often more severe. One was a slow, relentless erosion. The other was a series of catastrophic micro-events. Both, however, shared the same root cause. Engineers had pushed power and weight to a point where the locomotive's interaction with the track crossed a line from cooperation to outright assault. The very innovations that made these engines possible also made them inherently destructive, forcing railroads into a Faustian bargain where increased hauling capacity came at the direct cost of the permanent way itself. The destructive forces of hammer blow, wheel slip, and lateral nosing created a vicious cycle that railroad accountants dreaded. More power didn't just mean bigger fuel and water bills, it meant a radically heavier maintenance schedule that consumed manpower, materials, and money at an unsustainable rate. These colossal engines became black holes for maintenance budgets, and the tracks they ran on required constant feeding. For the track gangs, the arrival of an Allegheny or a big boy on their division was a declaration of war. These weren't locomotives that merely wore down the track, they actively dismantled it. Crews would have to follow specific routes known to be used by these giants, working tirelessly to repair the damage. Spikes loosened by constant lateral shoving, requiring redriving along miles of track. Rails heat damaged by wheel slip, creating weak spots that demanded immediate replacement before derailment. Ties and ballast pulverized by hammer blow requiring constant renewal. This wasn't preventative maintenance, it was emergency response. The railroad had created a mechanical predator, and the maintenance crews were the cleanup team, constantly repairing the carnage left in its wake. The financial impact was staggering. On lines where conventional locomotives might allow a rail to last for decades, the passage of these heavyweights could shorten that lifespan to a matter of years or even months on the most heavily trafficked and steepest grades. Rail replacement intervals, once a long-term capital expense, became a recurring operational cost. The same went for ties, ballast, and bridge timbers. Everything in the path of these engines endured exponentially greater stress. The accounting departments faced a grim new reality. The profit from moving a heavy freight train over a mountain pass could be entirely erased by the cost of rebuilding the track it just traveled over. The engine that was supposed to be an asset was behaving like a liability, consuming the very infrastructure that gave it value. And the maintenance nightmare wasn't confined to the tracks. The locomotives themselves were mechanical marvels of complexity, and that complexity translated directly into downtime. A simple, single expansion locomotive had one set of cylinders, one set of valve gear, one set of pistons and rods. 
but an articulated mallet had two complete engine units, each with its own intricate mechanism. A duplex, while on a rigid frame, still had the mechanical complexity of two power plants. This doubled the number of parts that could fail. Valve gear on these engines was notoriously finicky and required constant adjustment and lubrication. When a conventional engine went into the shops for repairs, it might be out for a day or two. When one of these giants broke down, it could be sidelined for weeks, requiring specialized tools and knowledge to put back together. Their reliability was, in a word, abysmal. They were high-strung thoroughbreds in a world that needed dependable draft horses, spending as much time being repaired as they did pulling trains. So why did railroads persist? Why pour millions into machines that were so clearly destructive and temperamental? The answer is simple, and it's written in the steep grades of the Allegheny Mountains and the serpentine curves of the Wasatch Range. These engines weren't indulgences, they were necessary evils. The economic and geographic challenges of American railroading left no other choice. Conventional locomotives, no matter how well designed, literally could not pull the required loads up the punishing inclines that define the nation's most important freight routes. Imagine the problem facing the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway. Their line from the Midwest to the Atlantic ports crossed the Allegheny Mountains, a relentless series of grades that demanded immense pulling power. A standard 280 or 2102 locomotive simply didn't have the tractive effort to haul a profitable tonnage over those hills. They could either run trains that were too light to be economical, or they could double-head locomotives, a solution that required two full crews and twice the fuel for a single train. The articulated Allegheny was the engineered solution. One massive machine, one crew, and enough power to drag a mile-long freight train up a 2% grade at a steady pace. It was a matter of operational survival. The track damage was a calculated cost of doing business, a price they had to pay to move the goods that kept the railroad solvent. It's like buying a sports car that eats through tires every month. Sure, it's expensive and impractical, but when you absolutely need to get up that mountain with 10,000 tons of coal, what else are you going to do? Take the bus? This was the brutal economic calculation every railroad faced. On one side of the ledger, the astronomical cost of maintaining track and the locomotives themselves. On the other side, the complete inability to serve their customers and generate any revenue at all without them. For routes like the Union Pacific's climb through Wyoming or the Western Maryland's ascent into the Appalachians, there was no third option. These engines enabled commerce that would have otherwise been impossible. They were the keys that unlocked the continent's interior, allowing raw materials and manufactured goods to flow on a scale that fueled national growth. The mountains demanded monsters, and the railroads had no choice but to build them. The ultimate limitation, of course, was the point at which the maintenance costs finally outweighed the operational benefits. This happened gradually, as these engines aged and their repair costs climbed, and as the cumulative damage to the track structure mounted, the financial equation began to tilt, but their reign was significant. They pushed the boundaries of what was mechanically possible and forced a parallel revolution in track construction. The need to support these giants led to the adoption of heavier rail sections, more substantial ties, and deeper ballast beds. Infrastructure upgrades that ultimately benefited all trains. In a final twist of irony, the stronger track infrastructure that these rail eaters necessitated was precisely what made the transition to diesel-electric locomotives so seamless. The diesels, with their lighter axle loads and smoother power delivery, glided over tracks that had been fortified to withstand the steam era's most violent giants. The era of the colossal steam engine was a spectacular, unsustainable crescendo in the age of steam. These machines represented engineering hubris in its purest form. The belief that any problem, even a mountain, could be solved with enough brute force. And for a time, they were right. But they also taught a hard lesson. Solving one problem often creates a bigger one downstream. The pursuit of raw power created machines that were fundamentally incompatible with their environment, 
destined to consume the system that gave them purpose. Their legacy is a mixed one. They are remembered as magnificent achievements, the largest and most powerful steam locomotives ever built. But they are also cautionary tales about the limits of scale. They prove that there is a point where bigger is not better, where complexity overwhelms reliability and where power becomes self-defeating. They were the necessary bridge to a more efficient future, a future they helped create by forcing the railroads to build stronger. So were these magnificent machines worth the destruction they caused? The answer is both yes and no. They were worth it because for a critical period, they had no alternative. But their brief, brilliant, and destructive reign also showed why they could never be the final answer. In the end, the T1 duplex and the Allegheny taught us an important lesson. Just because you can build something doesn't mean you should, unless it looks really cool. Then maybe. If you had to choose, would you sacrifice your tracks to move freight or let the mountains win? Let me know below.